run through them fairly quick. We're going to read them, then see how much we need to comment on them. But this is to show you a little bit about being recreated in his likeness and image. We'll see how far we get to go with it. But in 1 John 4, 17, it says, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Notice this is to, this is when our love is made perfect, when we realize this. It's when our love is made perfect that we can have boldness in the day of judgment. Imagine knowing that the day of judgment is coming and you're like, yep, I'm ready for it. Let's do it. Let's go through. Amen. That's how we're supposed to live. Why? Because we know that as he is, so are we in this world. Amen. Now let's keep going. It says in verse 18, there is no fear in love. But perfect love, and remember it just said, here is our love made perfect. But perfect love casteth out fear. As your love is perfected, then you will have no fear in your life. Because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Now see, these are internal things that we are to move toward and to make sure that they're part of us. So it says that if you have fear, your love is not perfected. So what that means is this, that in every area you have fear, your love for God and your understanding of his love. Remember, it is not perfect. Let me finish that. Now, remember he said that, behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Behold, what manner of love. Notice he says, we have known and believed the love of God. Do you get that? See, that, that, is, that scripture tells us where every problem stems from. If you have fear or if you don't, or if any area of lack or any area of struggle or any area of fear, as we said, any of those areas, if that's in you at all, what does that mean? That means that there is an area you lack understanding, knowing and believing the love of God. So it all goes back to knowing and believing his love. When you know and believe the love he has for you, how can you fear? If you think he loves you, I mean really loves you as God can love one, okay? Do you think he's going to let you starve? Why? No, he'll take care of you. You know that. Why? Because that's what love would do. That's why he tells you, feed the hungry. Why? Because love isn't going to let the hungry starve. And so he's doing something about it. What's he doing? He's telling you to feed them. He's, he's making sure it gets done. What is that called? Delegated authority. He has authority. He's given it to you. Now you take care of them. Why? Because that love, you have love for God, you have love for your neighbor. If you have love for your neighbor, then you guess what? You're going to care if they're hungry or not. All this goes back to love. And it goes back to knowing and understanding his love for you. If you know that he, his love for you and you believe that love, you think there's a possibility that you wouldn't be healed? Well, of course not. Well, first off, there's not a possibility that you won't be healed. Why? Because it's already done. He's already paid for it. It's already been taken care of. So there's no fear. Well, well what about this? What about that? What, you know, what if this doesn't happen? What if that doesn't happen? What if, what if I get laid off? What if I lose my house? What if I lose my car? What if, I, what if this happens? See, that's fear. You're not, listen, I don't care what job you do. Quit looking at your job as your source. God is your supplier. He is your source. All right? And no matter what happens with your job, you're, company could go out of business. Guess what? God's got another one. He's got one somewhere else that he can plug you into. And if you are faithful where you're at and you're living for him, loving him and loving your fellow man, then guess what? He's probably only got you there so that he can let them pay you and so that you can help the people who are there. Well, God, give me a better job. Well, what are you doing with the one you got? 
Why would you get another one if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing at the one you have? Well, I can't preach there. They'd probably fire me. Yeah, and that's how you'd get a better job. <laughs> no, you can't get a better job if you keep the one you got. Amen? And so we have to realize, what do we do? We have to trust in his love. Now listen, that's not, it doesn't come natural to your mind. You know, the Bible says that if you, whatever you say, you will have whatever you say if you doubt not in your heart. It doesn't say doubt not in your mind. Most people, if they doubt, most of them are doubting in their mind. The problem is when they doubt in their mind, they think and accept the fact that, or not the fact, but the thought, that they are doubting in their heart when they hadn't really doubted in their heart. They've just doubted in their mind. And when you say, well, I've now I've doubted so it won't work. Now it won't work because you just said it won't work. And the devil tricks you into that point. You think you've already given up when you haven't. You think you've already messed up when you haven't. So when you say, but, but sometimes I have those thoughts. Well, take no thought, okay? Don't take that thought. Jesus said, why take ye thought saying? So the thought can come. Just don't say it. Don't let it out. Don't let it stay there. Matter of fact, take all these thoughts, and the Bible tells us to do this. Take every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So a thought comes in, you look at it and go, huh, no, that doesn't match the promises of God. It doesn't match what God said. So I refuse. So I take that captive. I do not let it germinate in my mind. I don't let it bring forth more seeds. You have to drive that thing out. And it's not always easy, especially when you start. But you got to do it. That's the thing. It's not a, well, hey, I'm going to tell you, you know, a cool thing to do. Try this. That's not it. I'm telling you what works, what the Bible says to do. And he says, and you take all these things captive and you pull these things down. And he said, and take you into captivity. Every thought and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So these thoughts, like Brother Hagen used to say, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can sure stop them from making a nest in your hair. Right? You might, might not be able to stop that thought from coming in, but you can determine how far in it gets before you finally grab a hold of it. The problem is most people let it get all the way in and germinate. And they start, and it's amazing. You know how you germinate thoughts like that? You start imagining them. You start picturing them in fruition. So you have to, when that thought comes, before you even start picturing how that thought would look, you have to, no, 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 no. I take that captive. The Bible says this. You have that thought come in. Well, you know, if the company closes down, you're going to lose everything because everything, you know, we're going paycheck to paycheck. As soon as that thought hits you, you go, whoa, 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 no. The company isn't my supplier. God is my supplier. All my needs are met by God according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And then you say, well, yeah, but I, I did that and it didn't drive it out. I didn't say do it once. You do it until it leaves. And then you do it because it's gone. Now you're thanking God in it. Why? Well, how long do I have to do that? The rest of your life. You say, well, that sounds hard. Well, no, the hard part is what happens if you don't do it? See, you can, you can exercise, which is hard. Or you can not exercise, which will make your life harder harder. Amen? So it, you're going to have to decide. And the Bible says, exercise yourself unto godliness. You do that. People say, well, you know, the Bible says, you know, bodily exercise profits little. Well, that's the King James way of saying it, but what it actually means is it does help you physically in the here and now. That's what it means. But it's not going to help you in the hereafter. Why? In the hereafter, guess what? You ain't going to need no help. Amen? But you have to decide that you're going to do these things. This is the way of life. It's not something you do like, you know, taking medicine until the, you know, bottle runs out. No, you do this the rest of your life. This is exercise. This is something that builds you up and keeps you strong. And when you do that, then pretty soon, and see in the beginning, you may be fighting against something. That's always hard to start in the middle of a fight. But once you get over that fight, it may be a while before the next fight comes if you're doing the things you're supposed to do. Why? Because you'll be built up strong. The devil doesn't want to attack strong people. Why? There's too many weak people he can go jump on instead. He'll go to them first. Why? He doesn't want to fight. He wants you to lay down and give up. 
So when you start fighting back, he'll go, whoa, 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 wait, wait. So there's got to be an easier battle somewhere. And he'll go find somebody else. But that's up to you to decide to be a hard target. I mean, that, that's, that's your decision of what you want to do. Now, he says here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, let's talk about being recreated. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship. And we're talking about God. How good of a workmanship do you think God did in you? Well, you know, I'm just a worm of the dust. I'm just no good. You know, woe is me. And, you know, if it wasn't for bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all. Do <laughs> you think God makes junk? God doesn't make junk. Amen? You were made excellent. Now, you might have uh, cooled off some, okay? But the bottom line is, when God made you, he didn't make you junk. He recreated you in the likeness and image of himself, in the likeness and image of Jesus Christ. So when you call yourself junk, you're calling Jesus junk because you look just like him. Amen? This is how you have to start thinking. And you start realizing what he did, he did for me. And he didn't just do it so I can sit back and do nothing, you know, sit back on my blessed assurance and wait for the rapture or something. That's not what he did. He did it so that you can pay it forward. Right? He loved you first, now you love him. And if you want to prove you love him, you love other people. How do you love other people? By paying it forward. Paying forward what he did for you. He said, well, but you know, I've never really seen this or seen that. Well, then start with your own testimony, how you got saved. That's your biggest miracle anyway. Ask anybody around you. I'll just let that sit there a second. <laughs> okay. So, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. You were created for good works. Well, what good works? Well, Jesus said the works that I did, he shall do also and greater works. So that would be the good works you're supposed to be doing. Well, what are the greater works? I want to do the greater works. Well, why don't you just start with the same works? And when you get to the end of those, by then you'll know what the greater works are. But it doesn't do any good to tell you the greater works now if you're not even doing the, the other works. Amen? Because you build up to these things because everything starts as a seed. You get started. He says, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now think about that. Since everything was done from before the foundation of the world, then it was foreordained that there are good works that you're supposed to be doing. Now, some of those good works, you might have passed by today whenever you went to eat and that person was sitting there and you might have walked right past them and that was a good work that you were foreordained to do. You say, what do you mean? To pray for them, talk to them, encourage them. Listen, everything isn't healing. Some people don't need healing. Some people just need to be lifted up a bit. Some people just need a little bit of encouragement. Some people just need to be told, you know what, you're not worthless. Jesus died for you. That makes you worth him to God. It makes you worth him to God, put it that way. Why? Because that's what he paid for you. Some people are ready to commit suicide, and your one word could turn them around and give them hope for one more day. See, you don't know it. And people say, well, I'm not going to tip that waitress. Man, she was just no good at all. She was just, you know, hateful and rapping. You don't know what kind of day she's had. You don't know that she has to be at work because she can't be off, but yet her child is sick at home and she's worried about her child, but she can't take the day off because she can't afford to lose the day's pay. So you don't know everybody's life unless you talk to them. You might ask her, you know, excuse me, you see what's going on? Well, you know, my baby's sick. I have to be here. And all that. Well, you know what? Well, what's the matter with your baby? Well, she's got a fever. She got... Well, you know what? Let's take care of that right now. What, are you a doctor? Not necessarily. <laughs> but I work for, the, for a great physician. Right? So let's just take care of that. And then you speak health and healing to that child. See, you say, and then people say, well, that sounds good. No, it doesn't just sound good. It's Bible. It's how you live the life. Amen? Anybody can complain about a waitress or a waiter or whatever, what do you want to serve or what do you want to call them. Anybody can complain. It doesn't take faith to complain. Matter of fact, you cannot complain in faith. And whatever's not a faith, 
So where do you stand? See, we are here to encourage, to exhort one another as the day draws closer. Isn't that right? To encourage people and to build them up. Now, I'm not telling them, you know, look at everybody and go, you're going to heaven and you're going to heaven. It's not the Oprah, Oprah Winfrey thing. And you get to go to heaven and you get to go to heaven and you, no. Now, could everybody get to go to heaven? Yeah. But you go around and tell everybody you're going to heaven, you better make sure. I'm going to heaven? How do you know? Well, is Jesus your Lord? Well, no. Oops, sorry. <laughs> but we can fix it right now if you want to. You know. <laughs> sorry. I mean, and you're going to hell, and you're going. No, you don't want to do that either, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, an evangelist or a person. We're supposed to preach good news. Amen. It's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. Right. Not, not worrying about these things and, you know, talking about a person as they are. Thank God God didn't talk about you the way you were. He called you because of what he saw you could be and what he wanted you to be. So we ought to see that in other people. You know, to prophesy, it just simply means to encourage, right? To comfort, to exhort, that, to edify, to build up. That's what it means. Now, the Holy Spirit can move you to do that, but, you know, you can edify, comfort, and encourage all the time. Anybody. You can just walk up to a person and just comfort them and edify them and build them up and encourage them and exhort them. You know, talk to them a little bit and say, you know what? You sound like a believer. Are you a believer? Yeah, I am. Well, good deal. Come on. Let's, you know, man, let's wrap this thing up. Yeah, you know, Jesus, is, he's on his way. Let, you know, let's, what do you need to get on fire again? You used to be on fire, you're not now. What do we got to do to light your fire again? And just encourage somebody. You say, well, but did, did the Holy Spirit tell you to say that? Yeah, he said, do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. So we're supposed to encourage. He says to encourage, to exhort people as we see the day coming closer. You don't have to have a leading to do that. You just have to know, guess what? If, to, okay, if today is the tomorrow of yesterday, we're one day closer. So we ought to exhort more. How much did we exhort yesterday? Well, I don't know. I exhorted about five times. Well, then let's do six times today. We exhort more as the day gets closer. Amen? And so you say, oh, Chris, that's just, that sounds too simple. You want me to make it hard? Theologians have already done that for you. And it didn't work either. Right? What is it, too hard, too easy? What? Come on, Goldilocks, which is it? Or Red Riding Hood, or whoever you are, amen? <laughs> so, so, he says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, he tells him, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Notice he's writing to the Ephesian church, the glorious church. I mean, the Ephesian church was an amazing church. It was the church of the day. First, it was Antioch. Then it was Ephesus. And Ephesus was an amazing church. And it's funny because whenever this was written in the 60s, A.D., 60 A.D., roughly 62, 64, not the 1960s, okay, but in the 60 A.D., this was a glorious church. But by the 90s, just 30 years later, Jesus through the Apostle John, writes to the same church and says, I got something against you. So in 30 years, they went from this glorious, amazing, mature church kind of down the tubes. Left their first love, all kinds of stuff. Think about that. So your faith in God should be on a constant, you know, uphill. I mean, in other words, you know what I mean? It should be constantly growing. But at the same time, you don't, you don't see that with the Ephesians. They actually were up and amazing, and then they went down. Well, we don't want to go down. We want to keep going up. Amen? But it's up to us to decide to do that. Now, he says here that you put on the new man. He was talking to the church. He said, well, I thought I, we were a new man. Yeah, see, you are a new man. And if you live in the Spirit, then if you walk in the Spirit, let us live in the Spirit. If you live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Amen? So you can live in something and not walk in it. What's he saying here? Put on the new man. Well, I thought I was a new man. You are. Now put him on. 
be the new man on the outside that you are on the inside. That's why he said put on. He didn't say put in. He said put on. In other words, act like who, you're, who you really are. Don't act like somebody you're not. If you say you're born again, act born again. On the outside. Well, I'm waiting for God to change me. No, no, no. He didn't say that. He said he's already changed your heart. Now, then he said you renew your mind. And if you renew your mind, you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You want, you want your life transformed? You want a different life? You may be born again, but you may still have the same life. You want a different life? You have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So now you renew your mind to line up with who you really are. And there's ways to do that. There's ways to help you renew your mind. One of those is what, uh, what, what Paul wrote uh, to Philemon about. And he said, acknowledging that your faith will go out. And he says, by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. How does your faith grow? How does it get communicated to others? By you, now get this, by you acknowledging, agreeing with, recognizing and agreeing with every good thing that is in you in Christ. Notice he doesn't just say everything that's in you, right? Because everything that's in you wouldn't be good unless it's every good thing that's in you in Christ. He said, don't acknowledge necessarily just that you're good at this or good at that. He said, acknowledge every good thing that's in you in Christ. When you're in Christ, what is good? So you have to go back and find out what he said is in you. He said that greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. So you acknowledge that. You agree with it. And you start saying, you know what? Father, I thank you. And I acknowledge right now. And you don't just say it to him, but you also acknowledge it to others. If you confess Christ before men, he'll confess you before his father. So you confess him before men. You agree with what he said. And you start to say, Father, I thank you that greater is you that's in me than he is in the world. Amen. What does that mean? That means that guess what? Together, and we are, we can overcome anything. There's nothing I can face that together we can't overcome. And you start acknowledging <clears throat> every good thing that's in you in Christ. Amen. You acknowledge what you have. You acknowledge, Father, I think you have the mind of Christ. I thank you that I think soberly, that I have clarity of thought. I thank you, Father, that the memory of the righteous is blessed. Yes, thank you. Now, that means two things. Number one, <clears throat> when people talk about you or think about you, they're going to speak good things about you. But it also means that your memory is blessed. Amen? And nowadays, believe me, a lot of people need blessed memories. Now, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> get on there, there we go. Now, <coughs> look at the next one. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. <coughs> it says, now this was a prayer that Paul prayed for the Ephesians, and it's a prayer you should pray. It's something you can say every day. Excuse me. <clears throat> the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Okay? So that'd be the first thing you would say. Father, I thank you. The eyes of my understanding are enlightened. I see. Why? Because you enlighten me. Why? Because I have the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. And I thank you for it. He even says it right here. Okay? He says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Why? So that you may know now get this, what is the hope of his calling? Notice it doesn't say the hope of your calling. It's the hope of his calling. Why do you need to know the hope of his calling? Because his calling is your calling. Okay? He passed his job on to you. <clears throat> and so that you may know what the riches of the glory of his inheritance is in the saints. Notice Man, <clears throat> Ephesians is probably my favorite book in the Bible. I could just stay in there and just read it and read it and read it and go through it. I mean, it's just amazing. There's others too, you know, Colossians, Philippians, Galatians. I mean, it's amazing. But here in Ephesians, <clears throat> notice what he says. In the, here he said first, 
that you can know what, what is the hope of his calling. And then notice it says, and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? His inheritance in the saints. Jesus has an inheritance in you. Amen. Do you get that? What he put in you is his inheritance. Now, what are you going to do with his inheritance? In other words, the things he put in you. Now, number one, you are his inheritance. But that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the riches of the glory that is his in the saints. And so now he said, what is in the saints that is going to bring him glory to such an amount that he calls it riches? What is in you that can bring him that kind of glory? Because that's his inheritance is what's in you. Now, this is every believer. You realize this isn't for certain people. Well, it's for the saints, okay? And the faithful in Christ Jesus, which are in, well, he said in, in Ephesus, and then he said in the faithful, which is in Christ Jesus. So you don't have to live in Ephesus to be blessed with this. You just have to be the faithful in Christ Jesus. So when you're, when you're in Christ... He has an inheritance in you that he is expecting you to be using and increasing. It goes along with the parable of the talents. What did he give you? What are you doing with what he gave you? Are you hiding it? <clears throat> are you using it? Are you putting out for increase? Because when he comes, he's looking for fruit. He's looking for increase. He's looking for, get this, he's looking for more than he left behind. Now think about that. That's, that's what he, when he comes, that's what he's looking for. And you say, well, I thought he was just coming to see what we had done. Yeah, with what he had given you. you see, and you say, well, I don't, I, you know, I, I don't have any talents. I don't have any gifts. I don't, have. don't call Jesus a liar. He said he gave to every man. That's right. right? And so if he has given to every man, then you have something in you. Now, and just because you got one and not 10 or 20 or 50 or whatever it is, just because you got the one, don't hide the one. The man that in the parable of the talents, it said that he had these different people that did different things and all of them produced and, and increased. But this one guy who had one hid it. And that's the only person that the master said, take him, take from him what he has, give it to the one that already has, take him out and beat him with many stripes. People, and people wonder what the real Jesus is like. You have to remember, it's not that he's not compassionate or merciful. But you have to balance all of that with the fact that he is also just and holy. And he cannot condone un, you know, injustice or unholiness. He expect, that's why he said, be ye perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Well, that's too high a standard. Come on, be as perfect as God? Well, guess what? Number one, if he said do it, you can do it. Because he can't tell you to do something you can't do. Right? So if he said do it, then he knows you can do it. Now, usually when he tells you to do it, he tells you to do something you can't do. Okay? I know I just said the opposite. But I want you to realize why. That means that you can't do it to yourself. But that means he has to equip you to do it. And if he equips you to do it, now you can do it. So he tells you to do things you, he knows you can't do unless you lean on him and acknowledge him in all your ways. And when you do that, then he equips you and now you can do anything and you can do all things through Christ that strengthens you. Amen. Amen. Do you see how all of this works together? So there is nothing you can't do. You're, the biggest problem is you probably, maybe might have too small a dream. Too small. And I'm not talking about you coming up with a dream. Now listen, your dream should be his dream for you. Right? right. right? Your, your, your problem here might be that your God is too small. Right? If your God is too small, then you're only going to do small things. Well, I'm okay with it. Just give me a little house over in glory. Ain't no little houses in glory, okay? They're all mansions, okay? Well, I don't deserve that. Yeah, well, that's the first true thing you said. <laughs> Amen? 
Let's just be honest. Come on, we don't want what we deserve. Good Lord, we don't want what we deserve. Amen? That's the beauty of the gospel. We don't get what we deserve. Right? We, we get what he deserves. And guess what? He didn't deserve what he got. Why? Because he got the bad part. He got what we deserve. So we just switched out. Amen? But see, when you believe that and you go, you know what? He did that for me. I escaped that because of what he did. Well, guess what? He died for me, so what the least I can do is live for him. Right? And now how do you do that? You do it by acknowledging what his inheritance in the saints is and the riches of that glory. Now notice, the riches of the glory, which is in the saints, it, which is his inheritance in the saints. So what you have in you is designed to bring him glory. How are you bringing him glory? Because that's what's in you. Now, he says here, the next part. <clears throat> and what is the exceeding greatness? Now, you get that? Exceeding greatness. Now, if we took time and broke all these words down and looked at them in the Greek and give the definite, man, I mean, you talk about being thankful. You, you could just stand around and praise all day long. The exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. So now notice there is a power that he has released toward us, but it's according to the working of his mighty power. So you have within you the same power. See, the Bible says that Jesus was raised by the Holy Ghost. And he called it the glory of God. He was raised by the glory of God. He was raised by the Holy Spirit. So that power is the Holy Spirit. And it's the power that, that God used by way of the Holy Spirit to raise Jesus from the dead. Amen. That's the power that dwells in you. Wow. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. So you've got dead raising power dwelling in you. Yeah, yeah. And if you've got dead raising power, then guess what? Everything below that, everything less than that, ought to be a walk in the park. Uh -huh. Amen? Amen? You say, well, how do I know i got dead raising power? Uh, are you alive? Yeah. Are you born again? Yep. Then in the spirit, you've already been raised from the dead because you were dead in your sins and trespasses. And the greatest miracle you will ever see is your own new birth because the new birth is the greatest miracle anybody can see. We were talking about that a while ago. Uh, the same works in greater. What greater? Well, new birth is a greater. You realize Jesus never got anybody born again. He never got to lead anybody to Christ. Think about that. You realize that? He never got to tell somebody, okay, now you're born again. He told one guy, you need to be born again, Nicodemus. But he never got to lead anybody to get born again. Why? Because he had not yet been crucified. So nobody could be born again because he had not yet paid everything for them. I mean, now think about it. You, get to, you can go out here and get 20 people born again tonight. And you will have done 20 greater works than Jesus ever did. Amen? Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily the greater work he was talking about, but it's definitely a greater work. Because there is no greater work. So, he says in verse 20, you know, watch. Well, got to go back to this is all. It's amazing. When the Holy Spirit talks, he talks in long sentences. It's amazing. And if you go back to the Greek and look at the words and then you break those words apart and you put them back together and you get the definition of each word and you put that whole definition together with the next word and man, you'll have a, one sentence on one page. I mean, one page is one whole sentence. So why? Because you have to put all these words together to understand what he said. But he is long-winded when it comes to sentences. He made, he, he didn't speak a sentence. He spoke a paragraph. Right? And so, because you keep seeing this, he says here, verse 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead? So he said, what, is, what power is working in you? The power that he used to raise Jesus from the dead. That's how much power. That is the greatest display of power ever released upon the earth. 
was raising Jesus from the dead. And set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Now notice where that is. Verse 21. Far, not just above, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. Not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Do you see that? Do you, man, you just read this one thing. And if you said this every day, if you got up and thanked God for it and prayed this prayer, that your eyes, the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened so that you can know the degree of that power, that power that is toward us who believe, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead and set him at his own right hand. Think about that. That power, and you start thinking about that and talking about it and praying that out, and it starts building in you and revelation starts coming and you start moving in that, you will move in greater degrees of power, greater degrees of character. Why? Because that power doesn't just mean power to heal the sick. It's a total power. It's the power to heal, to make whole, to make complete. It's the power to set at ease, to set at peace. It's all of that together. And all of a sudden, you're just still walking around, feeling like, like you're a nuclear reactor, just whoom, whoom, you know? You're just like, glory to God. <laughs> find somebody sick, quick. Let me find, I need to put my hands on them or something. Wow, I'm getting overload. I got to release some, right? And you start thinking that way. And then somebody says, hey, do you think God would hit me? I don't think so. I know so. Take it. Just set them free. That's what Jesus did with the centurion. Lord, I got a servant at home, sick of the palsy. Grievously, I'll come heal it. Wait, I'm not finished. See, he interrupted him. Jesus interrupted him. You, how do you know? Because Jesus said, I'll come heal it. He said, no, no, no. You don't have to come to my house. He, he wasn't coming to ask him to come to his house. He was coming to ask him to speak the word. So Jesus interrupted him right in the middle of a sentence and said, I'll come heal him. Why did Jesus say, I'll come heal him? Because that's what he was used to having to do. Everybody else said, come lay your hands on him. So he's like, I'll come heal him. No, you don't have to. I get it. I understand authority. I have authority. I get it. You have authority. It's obvious. Just speak the word. See, that's why Jesus said, this was the greatest faith he'd found. See, this is how, think about this. This is how believers live. Now, unfortunately, most Christians are still like the Jews of Jesus' day. I, I got, I, I don't, I, I'd have to look and see. I know right now uh, there are at least, I'm sure it's over this because I looked at the number a couple of days ago. A couple of days ago, I had 74,000 unanswered emails that had come in to me that I have not been able to get back. 74,000. Okay? Well over 65,000 of those are life and death situations. And, and now the others are different things, and some of them are not life and death, but some, you know, most, the vast majority are. And people say, well, what, what are you doing about that? I'm believing. See, and I'm speaking. And I, 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 don't, I can't get back to everybody. And a lot of people think that I have to get back to them, that I have to answer them to get them healed. I don't have to do that. All I have to do is be able to see it. And when in my phone, when it comes from my phone, then I don't have to open it. I can read the beginning you know, of the email. And it usually starts with my baby's sick, my baby's dying, my sister, my brother, my father, my mother, something I can read that. And right then when I read it, I say, in Jesus' name. Now, I don't have time to necessarily go through and read every detail. I don't need every detail. All I have to do is send the word, speak the word, and I'm believing. But see, I have to believe. I can't just go, yes, you know, it's not like, uh, what is that, Bruce Almighty or whatever it is, where just <laughs> clicks yes on everything and all the prayer requests get hit. It's not, not like that, right? In reality, I, before every person, I have to stop and believe for that person. And then I have to speak. Remember the four stages of faith? Believe, speak, act, rest. That's what I have to do. I don't get to just go, oh yeah, oh yeah, whatever. Yep, yeah. it's not magic. And so I have to believe these things. But people, most people want to, and many of them now, they still want me to lay hands on them. They still want me to, in some cases, come. I've had, in the last two weeks, I've had two invitations to Israel. I had an invitation to... 
what was it? Some other country. Um, but what I'm, I've had a lot of other invitations to go there, but these invitations, or they are willing to fly me there just so I can lay hands on them because their loved one is sick. They're willing to fly me to Israel. They're willing to fly me to all over the world just to, and we'll, we'll pay all your expenses. We'll just get it. And I'm like, you don't have to do that. See, I don't, what, what I can do, I do by the Spirit. And what I can do in the Spirit, I don't have to be present to do it. So I can do from here whatever I could do from there. So I can save you the money of flying me over. As much as I would love to fly to Israel, you know, I'm not going to look at it as a vacation, you know, and fly there and lay hands on somebody and then spend a vacation there. I could. They would, they would still do it. But I, I want them well. I, I'm not looking for a vacation, right? And I'm not looking for an all-expense-paid vacation, Okay. But I have to look at these things and I have to decide this person healed by the stripes of Jesus. This is done. And so I have to look at that. But most people still want me to lay hands on them. They still want me to, to touch them, to call them. To say. Most people think if they don't hear me pray, I haven't prayed. That ain't true. Most people I don't call. Why? Because I know when I call, it'll be 15 minutes or more before I even get to pray. Why? Because they're going to take all that time to tell me every detail, every medical thing, and they're going to do everything they can to talk me out of faith and get me into sympathy. Because that's what happens. So instead of calling them back, I see the prayer request and I pray. God knows all the details. I don't need to know the details. I just have to be able to connect my faith to somebody. And I can do that whenever I see the first line of their email. And I start believing or whatever, I, whatever however much I have to read. There are times when I have to open it. But I don't, I don't get a chance to. This is not something I get to just sit back and, oh, yeah, this is the, yeah, be healed. Oh, be healed. It's not like that. You have to decide to believe. Why? Because this is somebody's life. This isn't something to just, oh, well, you know, it's great to be in, in demand. It's great to be wanted. It's great to be needed. No, it's not. I would rather not be needed. You know why? Because that would mean everybody's well. That would mean everybody understands what, you know, the truth of the Word of God. It means everybody's walking in the truth. Now, that's going to be awesome. When the body of Christ is walking in the truth and we almost fight over somebody to pray for. Oh, there's one. No, you get back. No, I'm, I'm getting this one. Imagine how that would be, right? And then you got people that come to the church there in Dallas. And I got, I got people there that get great results when they minister to the sick. Great results. And these people, they'll, these people will come to the church and say, um, yeah, I'm here for prayer. Or they'll ask them, are you here? Do you need ministry? Do you need prayer? Yeah. Okay, okay well, we'll pray for you. No, I'm waiting for Brother Curry. That's an insult to the Spirit of God. It's an insult to Christ. Why? Because he didn't give me a different spirit. If they're born again, they have the same spirit. I have taught them. They have learned. They, have, they, they got results. Listen, I don't just say it and then let people go. We have proven them. We make sure they know how to pray. We make sure they can get results. Why? Because I'm not going to let people loose on people that don't get results. And so, but then they say, well, I'm, I'm waiting for Brother Curry. That's an insult. It's an insult to God. It's an insult to the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he's the one that heals. I don't heal. They don't heal. But we have the same spirit. I remember, who was that? Um, originally, well, a person, well, I'm not going to give a name anyway, but a person went to a person for prayer. And they said, uh, yeah, I need prayer. And they said, okay, uh, can I pray for you? Well, I've been prayed for by the best. Oral Roberts has prayed for me, Benny Hens, and started naming people that he prayed for him. And he said, so let's see what you can do. Think, think about that. When I was in uh, Poland, I don't know, uh, we could probably show video, maybe not right now, I don't know if we have it or not, but if we can get it, we'll show it to maybe tomorrow. But there was, a, we did the uh, a, a meeting in um, Poland. It was the largest Christian meeting ever held in Poland. It was amazing. I had no idea, no, you know, they just said we're going to Poland. They set it up. We show up there. It's in a, a stadium thing, a sports stadium is what they call it. And it was packed. 
And so we're there, and I'm like, wow. And now, the thing is, they all, and in, in those kind of meetings, I lay hands on every person. We had thousands of people there. And so this young girl came in that was on crutches. She had never walked right. And her feet, her ankles were fused where she couldn't bend her feet like we can. And her feet were fused. So the only way she could walk was with the crutches. And all her life, she would, had walked with crutches. She would put the crutches down and then swing her feet because she couldn't, you know, move her feet. And she'd swing forward and, and you know, together and do that. Well, before that day, that morning, they came and got me and they said, we've got a man out here in a van that needs prayer. And if he, they're taking him right now to the hospital. Uh, no, they're taking him to a hospice place because the hospital turned him away and said, he's going to be dead in a matter of minutes. And they said they were taking him there. They heard about this. So they pulled him here. They said, can you pray for him? If you can't pray for him right now, we're going to have to take him on because he's going to die any minute. And this was before we got started that morning. So I said, yeah, let's, let's go do it. So I told him, do some worship, you know, keep him busy till I get back. I'm going to run out here. We're going to pray for this man. And so I went out to the van. Now, I'm cautious, okay? I've read history. <clears throat> Amy Simple McPherson was in time was on, a, on the beach near the, you know, in California. And a woman came up to her and said, would you come to my car up here on the road and pray for my baby? My baby's sick and dying. And so... Um, Amy Simple McPherson said, yes, I'll go pray. So when she got up there, they hit her and pushed her in the car and kidnapped her. So here I'm in Poland, and they're saying, would you come out to the van? So I'm kind of like, okay, who's going with me? Who's, you know, who's with me? Okay. And so we go out there. And when we get out there, there are police in the building next to us, this big uh, apartment complex. And there, I mean, we're talking hundreds of police. And right next to the van where this man was in it that it was dying, right next to it is another van, and it's a police van. So I'm like, okay, well, this is probably pretty safe. I got police everywhere. And what they were doing is they were doing a raid on the apartment complex next door to the stadium. And they were bringing all of these mafia guys out, and they were, they, they were stacking up gun, piles of guns that they were pulling out and stacking. And I'm walking out there, I'm like, what in the world is going on? You know? And so they opened the door in this van. They said, he's right in here. And there's a cop sitting in the van next to it. And he's looking at us and watching us. And when they open the door, this man's laying in here. He doesn't have a shirt on, but they have the blanket kind of pulled up over him. He looked dead. I knew he wasn't because I could see his breathing. His breathing was real short and static. And, you know, kind of, you know, you could tell. It's just, and when I started to pray for him, I remember I pulled the blanket down a little bit, put my hands on his chest. And the thought that hit me is he could actually die while you're praying. That's a thought that came through. And I'm like, no, he will live and not die in Jesus' name. I put my hands on him. Took 30 seconds. Commanded life. I get out. And as I get out, the cop is sitting there looking at me. He's just like, what are you doing? I'm, I mean, I'm, put, I'm getting in the van. I look like I'm doing CPR on him, you know. <laughs> and he's looking at me. So then I go back in, preach all day. That's a Saturday, the day of the healing service. And I preach all day long, preach into the night. And whenever it's time to do the healing service, there are thousands of people there. And so we have to do them by rows. And so as we do a row, they'd pick up the chairs and move them in the next row and the next row. And it went for hours and hours and hours. And we're just going through and laying hands. Well, the first, in the first row, and we got all this on video, but on the first row was a girl. Well, that day when I come back in that morning, I know I'm jumping around, but I'm trying to not leave out any details. But when I came back in, there was a young woman that came to me and said, I've got a friend that wants to know if she should come to the healing service tonight. And I said, well, what's going on? And she said, well, her ankles are fused. She can't move. She's never walked. And she can only move with crutches. And she said, but she wants to know if, she, if it's worth her coming because she's been prayed for by everybody. And so, and then she started naming people. And I said, well, yeah. I said, bring her. I said, man, uh, all these other guys that have laid hands on her, they probably got her this full. I said, all I got to do is top it off. And I said, yeah, bring her in here. So they brought her in, and she's sitting on the front row, and the, the video shows it from the side. And when I walk over to her, I walk over, and it's so funny because I'm, she's like, <laughs> it's funny because she's sitting there with the crutches. And I walk up and I put my hand on her head. And I've, I've never really done this before, but I saw it in the video later and realized that I did it. When I laid hands on her, first I did it here, and then I slid my hand around the back of her neck 
right here, and held the back of her head there for a few seconds, commanded life, commanded to be healed, and I stepped back, and I said, now get up. And she sat there, and you can see, she dropped the crutches, stands up, totally shocked, takes off running, starts dancing, starts moving around, screams, and even today, and I, this was several years ago now, and but even to this day, when I hear, now if I watch it without the sound, it's one thing. But when I hear her scream, I start crying. And I remember how she ran back and grabbed me and began hugging me. And I'm just pointing up, I'm, you know, because he's the one that did it. See, that, that's the beauty of it. I, I'm just there. I get to watch what he does. And then somehow people get it, give me the credit for it. You know, and it's kind of like, that's, it's him. He did it. And this girl is dancing around. Then later on, they show her dancing. First time in her life she'd ever danced. And there was a guy there that was, he was just dancing. And she spinning around, and she's just excited. And so the reason I'm telling that is because, like I said, she was that full. She was that close. What if she had not come? What if she just said, well, I've had the best pray for me? What? It's not about who's praying for you. It's about who they let work through them. It's that power that works in you. That's what counts. And it's that power that raised Jesus from the dead. Amen? That's the essence. See, that's who you are. That's what you've got. I don't have anything you don't have, except maybe some experiences. That may be it, right? Because that, that, I, don't, I don't claim a gift. I'm not trying to claim a gift or do anything else. I'm just saying, all I try to do is I, 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 t I try to take Jesus' places and then let him out. And then he shows off. And then we get to leave together and talk about it, right? And I get to go back to the hotel room and spend an hour or two crying and tell him how awesome he is. You know, that's usually after the end of every healing service. So, but that power that's in you. See, all I want to do is get you to believe that that same power is in you. Because if you do that, you can't hold him back. You'll do it. You'll believe. And he can do exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think. And it's like, wow. Just, just let him be him. Right? Well, have you ever seen? No, you'll be the first. Let's do it. See, it shouldn't be a matter of, well, have you ever seen? Well, no, I haven't. Oh, okay. No. You ought to say, well, I'm your first. Let's do it. That should be your attitude. Amen? We'll, well, we'll finish with this. And um, I've told people this before. I could go into a place and I could say, and the place could be packed out with a lot of sick people. And I could say, God told me that tonight, today, or whenever the time is, every person here is going to get healed. Except one. And as soon as I said except one, 99% of the people go, that's probably me. When it ought to be, I don't know who that poor person is, <laughs> but I'm getting mine. I'm coming. I came tonight. I'm getting mine. So whoever they, I really feel sorry for them, but I'm here and I'm going to get it. See, that should be our attitude. Amen? Amen. Not the, uh oh, okay, yeah, that's probably me. Why? Because we don't know. We don't know and believe the love he has for us. If it was you, I mean, come on. If you could heal a total stranger, somebody you don't even care for, you'd do it. Doctors try to do it through natural means all the time. Now, they get paid for it, so, okay. But if you could, you'd do it, right? And you're not God. You're not love personified. Now imagine if you would do that, how much more would your heavenly father, who is love personified, do that for you or do it through you? I asked God one time, why? Why, do you, why did you set this up this way? He said, there's only two times. Now, now think about this. See, you can't fellowship. Okay, I have an eight-year-old grandson. We can fellowship at the level of an eight-year-old. We can't fellowship at the level of a 64-year-old. Why? Because we have to drop to the lowest common denominator. Isn't that right? Because he wouldn't understand other stuff. So if I want to fellowship with him, I have to find a way to get across to him what I want him to know or understand or whatever it is. 
So I asked God, why do you use us? Why do you why did you decide to let humans lay hands on the sick and they get well? He said, there's only two times. He said, I want to fellowship with you. He said, I want to commune with you. But to do that, we have to have something in common. And he said, and there's only two times that you can feel what I feel. He said, one is when you give birth to your child. The first time you see your baby and you know that's your child, your flesh and blood, then there's a, an emotion, there's a feeling, there's something there that is you'll never experience any other way. And he said, that's what I feel for you. He said, and the other is, when you lay hands on the sick, and their bodies are healed, and they're made whole, and that feeling you get when you see that happen, he said, I want you to know how I feel. And when I, when I feel, whenever they're healed like that, that's what I feel for them. And I want you to feel for that. And if I can get you to feel one or both of those feelings, we got something to fellowship around. And I thought, I know exactly what you mean. Because people say, well, be careful, be careful. You know, God will use you and you'll get into pride. You got to get what you got to what. God doesn't heal everybody because, you know, that would make you get into pride. God doesn't keep people sick to keep me out of pride. You understand? That would be cruel in itself. But the reality is very simple as this. People that say that have never done it. Why? Because watching people get healed after you lay hands on them, it doesn't puff you up. It crushes you. And you realize, well, I know better than the person that got healed. That was God. Because they try to think I have something to do with it, but I know he did it. I know better than they know he did it because I know it wasn't me. And then I go back to my hotel room and cry for a bit and spend time going, God, you're so awesome. I got to see this. I get to see it. You're just amazing. And I spend hours just praising him and glorifying him for what he did. It doesn't puff you up. Now, here's the danger. You know what puffs up? It's not seeing the sick healed. It's how carnal-minded believers respond to it. And then they start saying, you're great. You're amazing. Wow, you're so anointed. Man, you're something else. You are so and I, what I hear is the voice of Satan. Why? Because Satan will put his hand on your chest and try to hold you back and go, who do you think you are? And try to get you to stop. But if that doesn't work and you keep on going, he'll get behind you and push you forward and go, you're great. You're awesome. You're amazing. And he'll try to get you to believe that you did it. That's the danger. See, we puff people up and we put them on a pedestal and then when they don't perform for us, we knock them down and somehow we blame them when they never asked to be on a pedestal. We put them there and we treat them like rock stars and then we get mad when they act like one. Why? We've got to get back to the reality that we are all brothers and sisters, that we're all of one spirit there's no big eyes and little U's. We're all in this together. We're all growing. We're all growing in different areas. But the bottom line is, he must have the preeminence in everything. Amen. It always has to go back to him. Amen? That's right. we got to stop. Go ahead, my brother.